okay is it visible yes ma'am okay so we will start with our question number 1 read the question an isolated metabolic reaction or different kinds of reactions outside the body of an organism performed in a test tube is option a is either living or non living option b is neither living nor non living option c is always living and option d is always non living answers I'm please you can type it option b okay so neha is saying option b sarana is saying option b we have one more person godwin okay i don't get any response from godwin anyway so what you have told is correct it is a direct question from our ncert textbook class 11 book which is in page number 5 okay so an isolated metabolic reaction which is happening outside the body means it is under a laboratory condition maybe inside a test tube or inside a append of tube or anything like that okay it is something happening outside the body and anything that is happening outside the body it is neither living nor non living we could not include that under the living category or we, we cannot say that it is non living also because the metabolic reaction is going on okay as the metabolic reaction is going on we can't even put it under the category of living because it doesn't have life in it okay so it is neither living nor non living next question true coelom appeared first in the course of evolution in okay so you will have to identify the organism where the coelom first seemed to appear good evening vidya shri that is question number 2 good evening ma'am yes answer options options are option a ashlanthus option b chordata option c echinodermata and option d annelida please choose the answers saranya says option c that is echinodermata okay saranya says option c what about neha ma'am annelida annelida okay is there anybody with a different answer okay so neha has said annelids and that is the correct answer okay godwin has also posted an annelids and i will give you the justification for that look at this picture uh before that is my powerpoint visible to every one of you is there any uh, problem with my voice or anything like that please let me know is everything fine yes okay That's thank you fine. thank you saranya yeah. fine so look at that picture there i have demonstrated a an acelomate animal okay then a coelomate animal and the pseudo coelomate animal so when you look at a coelomates a means a refers to something which is absent okay even when you go to school okay when you are absent your teacher would mark as absent if you are if you are not there in the class it would be marked as absent isn't it so a refers to something which is lacking or which is absent or which is not there which is not present okay so a coelomate animals or the animals that do not have a coelom in their body okay so coelom coelom is absent coelom is nothing but it is uh, the body cavity it is the body fluid where you see all the organs getting suspended okay look at the second picture you have the picture of a uh, annelid okay uh, basically it is earthworm so when you take a transverse section of the tissue of a coelomate animal you will have the outermost body covering which is the ectoderm okay and there is a middle region which is the mesoderm and the innermost region is the endoderm where you have all the visceral organs which is the digestive tract so you see uh, there is a region which is coelom that is present between the mesoderm uh, as sorry it is present between the ectoderm as well as the endoderm that is just on the covering of mesoderm okay so coelom is a layer okay that could be seen between uh, the outer ectoderm and the inner endoderm okay so coelom is a cavity where you have all the organs getting suspended okay look at the last one pseudo coelomate okay pseudo means something which is false which is not true pseudo refers to a thing which is not true or which is not genuine okay pseudo coelomates they don't have true coelom okay they have a representation of coelom but it is not a true coelom okay so outer layer ectoderm middle layer mesoderm and inner layer digestive tract in between that you have a layer which is pseudo coelomate okay so look at the examples also peculiar example for a coelomate is a flatworm what you see here is what is this animal can someone tell me what is this animal what is this 
yes answers please i want everybody to uh, be interactive only then you will get the real benefit out of this okay what do you see in the picture because you people are ready to get this yes neha solunga what is that ascaris oh my god anybody else with a another answer porifera porifera oh my goodness you people are getting ready for your neat exams isn't that you have only little time left for your exam and you should be thorough with all the concepts right now anyway don't worry okay so it is not uh, what what you are saying is porifera or what you were saying is something else okay it is not as care is also it is called as planaria what you see in the first picture is planaria have you heard about planaria children yes there is very special future about planaria that I, that you will have to know yes or no what about vidyashri godwin saranya there is something so special about this worm even it is a worm okay it is a planarial worm okay it is a planaria okay do you know what is so special about planaria yes children it has the ability to regenerate even if you cut the head okay the head can regenerate a new body okay if the head is cut off from the body the body can regenerate or regenerate a new uh, head in it okay any part of the body when it is cut okay that particular part can grow and it can develop as a new animal okay so that is what is this planaria it is so special okay that is a flat worm okay then down you have annelids okay what you see in the picture is earthworm and at last you have a nematode worm okay a nematode worm okay uh, like an ascaris okay or a tapeworm or something like that okay this is a nematode worm nematelm in this okay so this is the difference between the different categories of course chordates they have coelom okay and the first true coelom okay true coelom seemed to have evolved from phylum annelida okay annelid worms are the true worms okay other worms are not the true worms because they don't have the true coelom in it okay platyhelm in this they have no coelom so it is acelomate okay annelids they have true coelom so they are coelomate and when you look at nematodes they don't have a true coelom so they are pseudocoelomates am i clear to all of you yes or no yes ma'am okay good ne neha how about others shall we proceed to the next question some response children please give me some response yes no yes can we can we move on to the next question all right okay thank you look at this question symptoms like constipation abdominal pain cramps stools with excess of mucus and blood clots or of which disease okay amebiasis malaria ascariasis filariasis these are very characteristic symptoms you should be able to uh, identify it it is there in human health and diseases in uh, class 11 option a amebiasis option a most of you are saying option a and that is the right answer which is amebiasis okay so it is an abdo abdo uh, digestive disorder okay it is accompanied with constipation abdominal pain cramps stools and you see excess of blood clots and mucus can be seen with the stools okay so that is these are all the peculiar symptoms of ascari amebiasis okay whereas when you look at malaria there will be recurrent fever and in, in the case of ascariasis there will be severe abdominal pain just like amebiasis okay but there would be severe vomiting and also other discomforts and you know what is filariasis okay ucheria bancrofti is the filarial worm which causes swelling in the lymph nodes okay so the legs seem to be swollen okay that is due to the excessive accumulation of lymphatic fluid okay so all these symptoms constipation abdominal pain cramps stools with excess of mucus and blood clots all is related to amebiasis next question the given figure shows a cross section of the body of a non chordate okay it is a non chordate means it is an invertebrate okay identify the animal which has such a uh, cross section okay so you will have to identify there is a cross section displayed over here okay you will see the outermost layer which is epidermis and that is the body wall below that you have parenchymal cells and at the center you have the gut region where you have the alimentary canal okay so you have basically these three structures getting represented and you will have to choose which of these uh, animals have this 
uh, section in it. Answers please. Option A is cockroach. Option B, round worm. Option C, it is planarial worm, which is platyhelminth. And option D is annelid, which is earthworm. Answers, please. OK, Afrin has joined. Afrin, good evening, dear. Welcome. Can I get the answers from you for question number 154? Answers for question number 154. Answer A. Sarinya says answer A. That is cockroach. Just think for a while and give me the answer, children. Okay, just read the question if you want once again. Okay, there is a cross section of a non chordate animal that is displayed over there. Look at the picture very carefully. There is one particular region, okay, which is uh, making it distinctive from others. Okay, the outermost body wall, middle parenchyma, and the innermost alimentary canal. Option B, Godwin says option B, round worm. Okay. I'll give you a clue. My next slide will give you the clue and let me see whether you are able to give me the correct answer. Okay. Look at the pictures and give me the answer. Take a minute to go through all the pictures. Picture A. Uh, yeah, this, this is what is picture A. Where is my marker? Yes, this is picture A. Picture A is associated with cockroach. And this is what is picture B. Picture B is associated with earthworm. Sorry, it is associated with an Ascaris worm. And picture C is with the planarial worm. And picture D is with earthworm, what you see down here. Have you chosen the answer now? Answers, please. Don't ask me to go back to the previous slide because I have already displayed the previous slide. And if I go back, you will certainly give me the correct answer. Just think for a while. Okay, Sanania is saying option C. Okay. Anybody else with option C? Can you put up your hand? Whoever is going with option C? Hurry up fast. We have so much questions. Okay, Godwin has raised his hand. Afrin. Okay, so the correct answer is option C. Okay, option C seems to be the correct answer because I'll give you the explanation. I'll go back to the slide. Look at this. You have the parenchymal cells here. Okay, what you see here is the parenchymal cell in the middle layer, which is between the body wall and the alimentary canal. Look at the first picture. Can you see paren parenchymal cells anywhere? And when you look at the body wall of uh, cockroach, it is made up of a hard chitinous exoskeleton outside. Okay, it is made up of cuticle. Okay, cuticle is the protective covering that is covering the entire body of cockroach. Okay, look at option B. This is what is the cross section of uh, uh, ash helm in this worm, which is, for example, you have Ascaris there. And here again, you don't come across any parenchymal cells. Do you? Can you locate any parenchymal cells here? No, the outermost region is what is epithelium. Okay, in the center, you have the alimentary canal where you have intestine and all the other structures. There is again an outermost covering, which is cuticle. Okay, and here in the middle, you have different kinds of muscles like the radial muscles and the uh, circular muscles. Come to this picture, okay, which is the section of a platyhelminth worm, which is planaria. You see the outermost layer to be epidermis. Okay, and here you will see very peculiar parenchymal muscles. Okay, parenchymal muscles. So this is what is representing our cross section that is given in our question. So you see this parenchymal uh, tissue layer only in planaria. That is what is platyhelminth worms. Okay, platyhelminth worms have this characteristic parenchymal uh, structures. Okay, in their cross section. Okay, so very easily you can go with parenchyma. Okay, that is what is option C. Okay, even in earthworm you don't find any parenchyma. Can you locate any parenchymal tissue in uh, the CS or TS of earthworm? No. You can't. Okay. So the correct answer for this question is option C, which is planaria. So in the planarial, uh, in the in the planaria, in the cross section of planaria, you come across this parenchymal tissue. Not in cockroach, not in a round worm, also not in earthworm. Am I clear to you people? Yes. You need still more some explanation. You want me to explain more? Please let me know. I'll do it. Otherwise, we'll proceed. OK. Yes. Next question. 
Okay, so I have given the functions of parenchyma also. If you want, you can just note it down. So this parenchymal tissue helps to store food and nutrients. It provides support as well as a foundation to the organism. It is involved in growth and development. It provides mechanical rigidity in the case of plants. And it is the site of all metabolic activities. In addition to this, parenchymal cells have the ability to regenerate. And that is why this planaria has got this parenchymal tissue layer. Okay, regeneration, healing, wound healing. Okay, when we get uh, hurt, okay, when we get hurt, okay, after some time, you will see there is a layer of tissue growing on it. Certain. That is what is wound healing. Okay, and that is nothing but the parenchymal cells. So wound healing and repair of wounds, regeneration, all these are concerned with the parenchymal cells. Okay, none of the animals have this parenchymal tissue layer. What we have there as options. Okay, next question. Clotting factor released by platelets. Clotting factor released by platelets. What is that factor? It is such a simple question, direct question. You know, platelets are associated with clotting and there are certain factors that are involved in the process of blood coagulation. Answers, please. Factor 2, factor 3, factor 4, factor 12. Am I audible to you? I'm not able to get any answers. What is happening? Answers for question number 155. Answer for question number 155. Neha, Saranya, what about Godwin, Vidya? Hello, students, are you all there? Just give me some response, please. Neha, Saranya. From factor 12. Yes, factor 12. Saranya says option C. Anybody else with a different answer? Factor 12. Factor 12. So how many of you go with factor 12? Factor 12. Okay, so factor 12 is uh, associated with blood clotting. Okay, so you see, uh, factor 12 is a group of proteins, okay, that act on specific, uh, that act in a specific sequence to create a clot after an immediate injury. Okay, so factor 12 is concerned with blood clotting. Okay, so moving to the next question. The entire body of cockroach is covered by, just before sometime I give you the answer. Answers please, 156. A skin, B shell, C heart, chitinous exoskeleton, D keratin. Okay, so good Neha. Okay, Vidya has given option C. Do you all go with option C? You see the body of cockroach is not covered with skin. It is not even covered with shell or it is not covered with keratin. Okay, it is by a hard chitinous exoskeleton. Okay, this hard chitinous exoskeleton will protect the insect from different kinds of mechanical injuries. And that is why you see the insect uh, peeping into the hard rocks or any kind of uh, very hard substrates. Okay, the body doesn't get hurt because it has a hard chitinous covering as an exoskeleton to, uh, for its protection. Okay, next question. These are so simple and direct questions. Hibernating frog respires with. Can you tell me what is hibernation, children? Have you heard about hibernation and destivation? What is hibernation? Hibernation. Answers fast. Usually the frogs respire through their respire through their lungs, isn't it? Frogs respire through their lungs. Lungs are the major respiratory organs in the case of frog. But when they undergo hibernation, okay, what is hibernation? I want the answer. Um, conditions with lack of food. Lack of food. Okay. To be more specific. Give me a more specific answer. Can you tell me the difference between hibernation and estivation? I'm a winter sleeping animal. 
winter sleeping animal so very good so hibernation is winter sleeping okay and winter sleeping is the condition to escape from extreme cold okay when it is very cold okay just to escape from the extreme cold okay these animals uh, okay the state it is a state where the animals undergo minimal activity all their metabolic activities will slow down okay and that is what is called as metabolic depression okay metabolic depression and that is characterized by slow breathing and slow heart rate okay and that will result in low metabolic activity okay and that is what is the case with estivation also estivation is what is summer sleep to extreme to escape from the extreme uh, heat or extreme heatness okay animals will bury themselves under the soil okay and they remain dormant okay the uh, meaning of dormant is to remain inactive okay here again the metabolic activities will be lowered okay and all the uh, events that are happening in the body of that animal will be arrested for a particular period of time okay so that is what is estivation hibernation is summer uh, winter sleep and estivation is summer sleep don't forget all this these are very very important so even frogs will undergo hibernation when it is extremely cold okay frogs will not use their lungs for respiring okay diaphragm is also associated with the respiratory system diaphragm is not involved in the process of respiration when the animal is hibernating okay and what is the last option given there yes it is through skin frogs respire through the skin only when they are under the water okay you know frog is an amphibian okay partly it depends on uh, water for its existence and partly it comes to the land for its existence so when it is in the land it will undergo respiration with the help of lungs and that is what is called as pulmonary respiration so when it is on the land it will undergo pulmonary respiration but when it is inside the water it would use skin as its medium of respiration and diffusion of gases will take place through the skin of the animal are you all following me children are you all there yes or no okay so you see option c which is buccal epithelium okay so i will tell you what is this buccal epithelium okay they are nothing but uh, it is just in the just they are just ciliated epithelial cells okay which is seen lining the buccal cavity of the frogs okay they are just ciliated you know what is what are ciliated epithelial cells okay i have discussed more about this when i was dealing with the structural organization in animals so you have ciliated epithelial cells okay and these ciliated epithelial cells can be seen lining the buccal cavity of the frog so when the frog is under hibernation it would keep its mouth open okay so that air can diffuse through its uh, buccal cavity buccal cavity is nothing but it is the oral cavity it is the mouth children okay so frogs respire through the mouth when it is under hibernation so there you have buccal epithelium having ciliated epithelial cells okay they are just hair like structures and they play a major role in the diffusion of gases okay major role in diffusion of gases so what is the correct answer over there a hibernating frog will undergo respiration through buccal epithelium is it clear to everyone is it clear to every one of you yes no yes all right so don't forget all this okay so hibernation is what is winter sleep that is during extreme cold and estivation just is just reversal of that it is uh, summer sleep which is during extreme uh, summer okay moving to the next question okay which of the following is not not the component of ats rna okay ats unit of rrna which is ribosomal rna you should be knowing what is this rna okay uh, rna is what is riboxy or uh, nucleic acid okay so you see here uh, you have two different categories of rna one is in the prokaryotes and the other one is in the eukaryotes okay i will just show you the picture you will come to a conclusion so this is what is the prokaryotic ribosome which is of ats type okay s refers to the unit of the ribosome okay which is the sedimentation quotient and it has the swedberg unit as its uh, unit 
okay and this is what is the eukaryotic ribosome which is ats okay so 70s is the sedimentation coefficient of prokaryotic ribosome and 80s is the sedimentation coefficient of eukaryotic ribosome so when you look at the 70s type of rrna okay it has two subunits okay these two subunits have different uh, sedimentation coefficients one is with 50s and the other one is with 30s okay if you want please make a note of this i don't think this is there in your ncert textbook but you will really get questions based on this okay so don't get confused so prokaryotic ribosomes has two subunits the larger subunit is what is 50s subunit and the lower subunit is what is 30s subunit and when you look at this 50s subunit it is still made up of two smaller subunits which is 5s rrna and 23s rna and this 30s unit also has 16s rna in it okay and when you look at this 80s rna it has two subunits that is 60s as well as 40s so here you see three divisions 5s 5.8s and 28s i repeat 5s 5.8s and 28s and the lower unit which is the smaller subunit has 18s rna in it and our question was which was not associated with the 60s unit of the uh, 80s rna okay i'll go back to the question so you have 23 5.8 18 and 5 what is the correct answer what is the correct answer answer for question number 1 option a yes option a okay i'll go back to the picture if you want you don't have 23 here you will have only 28 over here okay you have 28 28 is there and you have 5 is which is also there and 5.8 is but but you don't have anything which is 23 over there okay 23 is missing over there and you have 18 also yes yes ma 18 also missing ma no no you have 18 here in the 40 is unit right and but just like 60s sub unit just give me a second i'll just go through what is the component of ats unit which is the ats type of ribosome my dear okay when you look at the prokaryotic ribosome it is 70s type okay the prokaryotic ribosome is of 70s type and the eukaryotic ribosome is of 80s type am i clear okay so yes, when you look at the eukaryotic uh, ribosome there you have 5.8 18 5 as well as one more unit which is 28 all right so all these are represented by the 80s type ribosome okay which is both present in the 60s as well as the 48 subunit okay so only thing that is lacking is 23s you don't have anything like 23s there okay so the odd one here is option a which is 23s rrna unit next question the hardest constituent of tooth is answer is very quickly first yes it is option a which is enamel okay hardest part is what is enamel okay look at the other options dentine no pulp bone your teeth does not have bone pulp which is again a soft region where you have the uh, roots okay and all stuffs over there so the hardest constituent is only the enamel moving to the next question stomach and vertebrates is the main site for the digestion of again a direct question proteins carbohydrates oh my goodness neha neha be very clear neha proteins carbohydrates fats nucleic acids choose the major nutrients that is getting digested in the stomach i'm sorry no even it is not nucleic acids the answer for this question is option a which is protein why didn't you choose protein children why did you leave out protein then where is protein digestion happening your carbohydrate digestion starts right from your mouth okay where you have salivary amylase acting upon starch okay your protein molecules are not acted upon by the starch or amylase or anything that is associated with your mouth it should come down 
okay and once it comes to the uh, stomach you have all the digestive juices along with hydrochloric acid hydrochloric acid will activate all the inactive enzymes like pepsinogen renin okay then trypsin all these enzymes what are they associated with they are di associated with digestion of proteins am i right yes or no do you all agree with me pancreatic lipases amylases yes why what happened any confusion in that i will be teaching you in detail about the process of digestion also okay then you will understand more clearly but not now okay so the major site for digestion of proteins is in the stomach okay stomach is concerned with the digestion of protein right students any confusion please let me know because i don't get any response from you people are you confused how many of you say that you are very much confused now neha saranya vidya gordon shall we proceed yes ma'am yes ma'am okay so please remember protein digestion is in the stomach okay next question late trial okay late trial which is called as amygdalin uh it is believed to be used in anti cancer treatment okay and you should identify uh but i'm sorry the options what are given here is completely wrong the right option is not here but can you tell me what would be the correct answer it is not vitamin uh q or b12 two times vitamin b12 is repeated over here i don't know what is the error over here and then vitamin d12 no nothing like this can you tell me what is the answer for this question late trial what is this late trial have you heard about this children no just give me some response ma'am it is a bitter substance found in fruits it is yes it is a vitamin found in the fruits okay and it is called as vitamin 17 okay it is vitamin 17 it is called as vitamin 17 and this is used in uh, cancer treatments okay like in uh, some kind of almonds apricots peaches plums okay all these uh, fruits they have this compound which is called as amygdalin okay amygdalin so amygdalin is uh, used in cancer treatment and it has been said that it has good number of antioxidant activities okay and this is most effective in killing cancer cells okay that is what is lytrile or it is uh, otherwise called as amygdalin okay even in the raw nuts okay cashew nuts everywhere you can see but uh, one dangerous thing about is that it could create hydrogen cyanide okay and it can be poisonous to the body when it is taken in higher concentrations okay so it could cause uh, cyanide poisoning okay cyanide poisoning is very common uh, when this uh, amygdalin rich fruits are consumed in excess amounts okay but it is a naturally occurring compound and it has uh, proven records to show that it has uh, cancer curing activities also but when it is taken in excess amount eating excess of this amygdalin could result in cyanide poisoning into in our body okay which could ultimately uh, result with death also okay so vitamin b17 is associated with this amygdalin okay so vitamin b17 is associated with vitamin b17 is associated with amygdalin right shall we proceed b17 but i don't know unfortunately the options given here are totally wrong okay just b17 children please make a note have you noted yes okay we'll proceed now right if a man from sea coast goes to everest peak if a man from sea coast goes to everest peak then option a his breathing and heartbeat will increase option b winter his breathing and heartbeat will decrease his respiratory rate will decrease his heart be beat will decrease it's a direct question even from our lower classes we have been learning about this concept option b option b breathing and heartbeat will decrease 
how many of you go with option b yes okay and that is the correct answer okay so as we move up to the altitudes okay uh, we experience the kind of suffocation isn't it the oxygen binding capacity will be lowered because at high altitudes you see the amount of oxygen will be low when compared to the uh, sea coast when compared to the sea level okay we reside in the sea level but when we go to a high mountainous region okay there could be extreme suffocation just give me a second i'm getting a call i'll just I will be back in two minutes, children. I have got an important call. I'll just answer it and come. Just give me two seconds, okay? Okay, I'm sorry, I'm back. Are you all there? Are you all there? Yes, ma'am. Yes. So the answer for that question, okay, question number 162 is breathing and heartbeat will decrease, which is option B. Let us proceed. We have more questions, children. Let us be a little fast. What is the functional residual capacity? Okay, what is the functional residual capacity in an adult human being? Okay, so this is a term that you come across. Uh, in human physiology under uh, respiration okay breathing and exchange of gases but this is a most familiar question yes can you give me the answer for this question what is the functional yes option b yes it is correct it is 2500 ml okay you know frc is what is functional residual capacity and explain and i'll explain you what is this so you see it is the volume of air that is remaining in the lungs after a normal passive exhalation. It is no, it is a normal exhalation. Okay, after you exhale, after you uh, do a process of expiration, okay, there will be some uh, portion of or some volume of air that is remaining, and that is what is called as the functional residual capacity. Okay, and uh, it is basically the time when your lungs. Uh, you know, lungs are basically elastic and they recoil the chest wall and this outward expansion, there would be a balance between the outward expansion and, their, and the inward contraction. Okay, there will be a uh, balance between the expression and the inspiration. And that balance is uh, brought out by this uh, remaining or the little amount of air that is uh, stored up over there. And that is what is this functional residual capacity and it is calculated by a formula which is ERV plus RV. Okay, ERV is nothing but it is the expiratory reserve volume. Okay, expiratory reserve volume is the additional air okay that can be forcibly exhaled after the expiration. Uh, that when we do it forcibly, okay, that we do it wanderly. Okay, doing extra expression is what is that extra expiratory reserve volume and this reserve volume is the volume of air that is remaining in our lungs after a maximal exhalation after doing a maximum exhalation the remaining part of air that is remaining is what is the reserve volume so this functional residual capacity is equal to ERV plus RV so ERV is what is expiratory reserve volume and RV is what is reserve or residual volume okay and which will be equivalent to 2500 2500 ml or 2.5 liters is what is the functional residual capacity next question Haldane effect okay is due to an increase in it's a direct question can you answer me Haldane effect what is this Haldane effect where do you come across this Haldane effect Haldane effect, children. 
what is that i don't get any answers am i audible to you people well the opportunity that come in contact with carbon dioxide very good very good okay so it is the uh, displacement of uh, oxygenated blood with the uh, carbon dioxide from the hemoglobin okay or increasing the removal of carbon dioxide so you know carbon dioxide is trans transported by the hemoglobin as well as oxygen is transported by the hemoglobin the deoxygenated blood has to get oxygenated when oxygen tension is rising okay and that binding is what is called as this haldane effect okay and it was described by uh, john scott haldane okay john scott haldane was the person who first uh, described this property of hemoglobin okay so it is the tendency of uh, deoxygenated hemoglobin uh, you see basically the deoxygenated hemoglobin has a higher affinity for carbon dioxide than does the oxyhemoglobin okay so deoxygenated hemoglobin will bind up with carbon dioxide okay than with oxyhemoglobin okay so what is the correct answer over here from option a yes option a is the correct answer it is carbon dioxide is due to increase in carbon dioxide next question coagulation of lymphus coagulation of lymphus faster than that of blood not possible slower than that of blood a passive process will uh, lymph nodes coagulate will the lymph coagulate do you think that the lymph will coagulate you have platelets in the blood okay and that will create coagulation of uh, the blood okay but when you look at lymph will the lymph coagulate will the lymph coagulate children you know there are certain coagulation factors in the lymph okay uh, fibrinogen is basically what is involved in the process of coagulation okay so there you have in the lymph also you have certain uh, particles that would cause the process of coagulation okay but when you look at the process of coagulation it is comparatively slower than that of the blood okay because uh, the amount of fibrinogen or the amount of fibrin is comparatively low when compared to the blood okay so coagulation of blood uh, sorry coagulation of lymph seems to be slower than that of blood okay because the amount of clotting factors are less in blood sorry in lymph okay the amount of clotting factors are low okay in lymph when compared to blood am i clear to you people yes, yes ma'am no. okay let us proceed yes circulation in humanus circulation is hum in humanus single and open double and open double and closed single and closed then double and closed it is absolutely correct it is double and closed okay these are basic questions i think i can skip with this so that we can uh, save some time during exercise the following increases during exercise the following increases diastolic pressure venous complaints stroke volume all of these all of these so when you do a severe heavy exercise okay what is happening what is happening what is increasing the stroke volume is increasing okay the stroke volume i will tell you what is this stroke volume okay so when we do a heavy exercise we seem to sweat a lot okay and there will be an increased supply of oxygen because uh, all our metabolic activity seems to get increased when we do a heavy uh, exercise so the stroke volume is the volume of blood in millimeters which is getting ejected from each of the ventricle okay from the right ventricle as well as from the right, left ventricle due to the excessive contraction of the heart muscles and that is where uh, the heart muscle seems to beat fast okay when we do a heavy exercise so there will be excessive pumping of blood from the uh, ventricles and that is what is called a stroke volume okay so please remember stroke volume is the excessive pumping of blood from the ventricles so that 
the energy requirements and the metabolic requirements will be easily met by the uh, uh, cells in the body. Okay, so that is what is stroke volume. Okay, let us continue. Body fluids of shark and coelacanths are slightly hyperosmotic to seawater due to the retention of water. Okay, hyperosmotic means increased salt concentration. Can you choose the correct answer, children? Can you choose the correct answer? Okay, I'll tell you the answer. The answer is option D, which is urea and trimethyl amino oxide. Okay, trimethyl amino oxide and urea accumulation will cause excessive uh, accumulation of salts. Okay, so that is what is hyperosmotic. So in fishes like some kinds of shark and coelacanths, okay, their body fluid seems to be hyperosmotic to the seawater. You know, seawater is hyperosmotic because it is having higher concentration of salt in it. Okay, so when you look at the seawater as well as the body fluid, as well as the body fluid of these sharks or some coelacanths, Okay, it seems to be slightly higher. Okay, and that is mainly due to this uh, deposition of two compounds, which is urea and TMAO, which is trimethyl amino oxide. Okay, please remember that. Don't forget. Next question. The effect of ADH okay, on kidney is two. What is this ADH, children? What is ADH? What is ADH? Are you all there? What is ADH? What is ADH? Yes, it is antidiuretic hormone. It is also called as vasopressin. Okay, antidiuretic hormone is also called as vasopressin. Okay, so what is the effect of antidiuretic hormone on kidneys? Option A, increase water excretion. Increase sodium excretion. Option C, increase permeability of distal convoluted tubule to water. Increase glomerular filtration rate. Increase glomerular filtration rate. Just think for a while and give me the correct answer. Think and give me the correct answer. Yes, what is the effect of ADH on kidneys? Effect of ADH on kidneys. I'm increasing sodium. Very good. Yes. Okay. How did you come to that answer? How did you come to that answer? Okay. So when you look at this antidiuretic hormone, okay, this hormone has the ability to bind with the receptors. Okay, on the collecting ducts of uh, the nephrons. Okay, so as this antidiuretic hormone binds to the receptors, okay, it will stimulate the kidneys to release less water. Okay, and it would uh, decrease the urine output. Okay, the output of urine is getting decreased. Okay, so a high level of ADH causes the body to produce less urine. Okay, as well as when the level of it goes down, there will be excessive urination. Okay, so this is mainly due to the retention of ions, especially the sodium ions. Okay, mainly the sodium ions. So increased sodium plus excretion, okay, is what is the effect of ADH on the kidneys. Ornithin cycle operates in ornithin cycle. What is this ornithin cycle? What is this ornithin cycle? Ornithin cycle, it is the urea cycle, children, okay, urea cycle, it is the cycle where urea is getting produced and uh, sent out of the body along with urine, okay, so ornithin cycle, where does it occur, what is the site of this ornithin cycle, in the liver cells, okay, so it is in the liver cells or in the hepatocytes where this ornithin cycle is taking place, right, students, 
okay so it is in the liver it is not in the nephrons or not in the pancreas or not in the kidneys it is in the liver where this ornithin cycle is taking place right shall we proceed shall we proceed yes ma'am right. so these are certain basic things children please don't forget all this next one which of the following is involved in amoeboid movement amoeboid movement centrion cilia flagella microfilament okay so i'll give you the correct answer it is microfilament okay microfilament is what is uh, involved in the characteristic amoeboid movement okay centriole is not associated with movement cilia is associated with movement and flagella is also associated with movement and when you look at the ciliary movement and the flagellar movement okay they just shake okay the vigorous shaking will bring up a movement whereas when you look at microfilaments okay they exhibit characteristic amoeboid movements okay now sesamoid bone is derived from sesamoid bone is derived from what is the answer sesamoid bone is derived from can you tell me the answer children where is the sesamoid bone derived from can you tell me so sesamoid bones or the round bones okay that could get embedded within the tendons okay the sesamoid bones will reduce the tension within the tendons okay so you see the sesamoid bones within the knees thumb uh, in the toe okay the round bones is what is the sesamoid bones okay so the sesamoid bones seem to be derived from the tendons so it is option c okay so question number 72 it is option c joint between bones of human skull okay what is the joint that is seen between the bones of human skull what is that hinge joint synovial joint cartilaginous joint fibrous joint fibrous joint fibrous joint that is the correct answer okay fibrous joint is the uh, joint that connect the skull bones next one the nerves are made up exclusively from the where are the ner nerves made up made up from dendrons axons nodes of ranvier nissel's body have you found the answer it is option b from the axons okay so axons are from where the nerves get innervated so many nerves join together and get clubbed at the axon point of the neuron so you have axon cyton okay dendron all those parts associated with the neuron so it is in the neuron where you have all the nerves getting exclusively uh, combined together stereoscopic vision is found in stereoscopic vision option c yes okay primates stereoscopic vision is found in option c that is primates okay so i think i can stop with this uh remaining questions we will discuss in tomorrow's class we have still some more questions to discuss we'll do that in tomorrow's class okay by the way if you have any doubts or any clarifications please contact me and get clear with your doubts all right children so i'll meet you tomorrow thank you all thank you for joining thank, thank you, you.